Hi, I'm Austin Nauert, Conference Programming Manager at South by Southwest. Welcome to South by Southwest Sessions Online, our ongoing series of virtual conversations. Today, we're excited to have Lawrence Wright and Lila Shapiro join us. Lawrence Wright is a staff writer for The New Yorker, a playwright, screenwriter, and Pulitzer Prize winning author. He's joined by Lila Shapiro, a senior writer for Vulture and New York Magazine, where she covers such topics as film, TV, books, and entertainment. Lawrence and Lila will discuss Lawrence's timely new novel, The End of October, how the idea for this novel came about, the rigorous research that went into it, and the heroes working on the front line of a pandemic to keep us safe. If you haven't read this novel yet, I can't recommend it enough. It is eerie how prescient it is given what we're going through right now, and I couldn't put it down over the few days it took me to read it. So without any further ado, please welcome Lawrence Wright and Lila Shapiro. Thank you, Austin. Good morning, Lila. Good morning. Uh, how are you doing today? I am healthy and well and 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 bored <laughs> sitting at home. I feel like I'm in Groundhog Day. Feels like the that is like the best case scenario right now. That's um, right. That's right. I have <laughs> nothing to complain about. Same same over here. Um, well, it's it's interesting. I mean, when we first spoke um, about your book, you know, it was really kind of early early days um, of this pandemic still. Um, but I, I wanted to ask you, and I asked you then, like, you know, what was it like for you? You know, you've written this book uh, set in the spring of 2020 about a pandemic that rages around the world and causes chaos and lockdowns and death. And what was it like for you as you, you know, saw this beginning to play out in the world? Well, it was uncomfortable. It was strange, weird, even, you know, I, I did expect a pandemic would hit. I mean, that was the whole point of writing the book. I, you know, I spoke to all these experts. They all told me this was going to happen one day. We didn't know it was going to be today. Uh, so it was, it's a, it was designed to be two things. One is a thriller and the other is a, a cautionary tale. Uh, and now, of course, you know, it's come out in the middle of a pandemic that is different in many respects from the one that I wrote about, but also eerily similar in others. And so uh, it, it's, it's just a very peculiar feeling, Lila. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's funny, like it, it, it is, it reads like a thriller, but it, when I read it, it was very scary. I mean, <laughs> in a way that I feel like it wouldn't have been if, um, you know, if we hadn't been in the midst of this. I mean, I did, I read it in lockdown and, you know, in in the book, the timeline, you know, is, is even sort of more frightening. You know, I mean, in June, in your book, there, like, there's already been like a run on the ATMs and right. it's hard to find groceries. Although, you know, there's, there's some ask. I mean, as you watch these things playing out in the world, are you sort of thinking to yourself, like, this is what happened in the book, or like, this is a different schedule? I mean, how does that sort of play out for you? Well, I confess, I do keep score on myself. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I can't help it. I, there are things that that uh, that I got eerily right, and most of that is because uh, you know these were already uh, you know scenarios that had been gamed out in, in tabletop exercises and you know the experts had studied this and prepared for it so i simply wrote out the script that uh, you know that they had suggested to me on the other hand there were lucky guesses that you know i you know putting this vice president in charge of the task force and stuff like that and you know the you know, we're many many similar things but you know there are things i got wrong uh, I, I underestimated uh, the solidarity of individuals to willingly isolate themselves for months. You know, a horrible price to themselves, economically and socially and even spiritually. You know, they're, you know it, it's been marvelous to see the sacrifice that people have been willing to make to protect themselves and their community. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that uh, what makes a big difference in the book is that there's food insecurity and the ATMs go down. Uh, if you add those two things in, I think you'd have a different scenario than the one that we're living in right now. 
right? It's like we, you know, maybe you can't find like the kind of meat you want at the supermarket, but right. it's not like, you know, there's nothing, there, it's not like this, the stores are really empty. I mean, yeah. it's, really, it's very different from that. Um, yeah, it is. And it's, uh, you know, the, the virus is, my virus that I created is really built on the Spanish flu of 1918, and uh, which was horribly devastating. And uh, it marched along at about the same pace as the one that we're experiencing right now, although I hope it doesn't continue because you know, what happens in 1918 is that it dies down in the summer and then comes back in the fall in October 1918 is the deadliest month in American history. So this is not something we look for. But, you know, my question to the experts I talked to was what would happen if something like that came back? You know, what, in our modern society, would we be any better prepared than our ancestors were in 1918? And the answer is obviously very mixed because, you know, we, we're, society hasn't broken down, but we're facing a terrible economic disaster. And, uh, you know, we're maybe going back, you know, maybe we're going back into society too quickly in order to try to remedy uh, the economic damages. We'll find out soon if that's true. But, um, you know, the, 1918 flu killed between 50 and 100 million people. Uh, it was far more deadly than the COVID-19 virus, but probably not as contagious. Mm. I want to go back to like your, or, you know, the original inception for the project and sort of how, how you found yourself in this situation of having this book come out, you know, in this particular moment. When, when was, what was the first seed of the idea? Well, it started with Ridley Scott, he, uh, the filmmaker. He had read the Cormac McCarthy novel, The Road. And, uh, you know, it's a story about a father and a son wandering through the ruins of civilization. And, uh, you know, it's not explained how that happened. And so that was Ridley's question to me was, what happened? You know, what would cause civilization to just, you know, break apart, crumble? And did you consider like other other possible, you know, means to the end of the world? Yeah, I did. I mean, nuclear war was high on the list. Uh, <laughs> climate change wasn't as much on our minds back at that time. But, uh, you know, one of the problems with nuclear war is, you know, where are the heroes? You know, I mean, you know, essentially, you know, people push buttons and, you know, and millions die. Um, but in public health, you know, I had done stories out of the CDC when I was a young reporter, and I had been very impressed by the, the heroism and the ingenuity and the courage of people that I found in that world. And so it seemed to me that that would be a good place to, to set the novel and originally the screenplay. Uh, and it's, you know, it's just show, you know, the, what, what happens when you have a pandemic? And also it gave me an interesting opportunity to look at the world that we're living in, all the fractures, the partisanship and so on, the rivalries between nations. Take the world that we live in and add stress in the form of a pandemic and then plausibly plot out where things might go. Right, I mean, that's such a, it's such a, you know, big, part of both your book and like the narrative we're living through now, which is like all of these cracks that have already already existed in the world just break apart. And you see, you know, as, as, as that pressure is applied. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's interesting when you think about like the heroes though, too. I mean, like I, when I was talking to, um, you know, when I was writing the profile of you, um, I talked to a couple of the, um, you know, experts that you uh, interviewed. And I think they really appreciate it. You know, one of them, who's the, the head of um, uh, Pfizer vaccine research told yeah. me, you know, <laughs> he was delighted because he felt like not only could a book like this, you know, help sort of repair the public if a pandemic were ever to occur, but like that, you know, he felt like stories in which a middle-aged workaholic of virologist, <laughs> you know, <laughs> are in short supply. Um, yeah. 
And did that appeal to you too? Like having this hero who we don't really, or at least before this happened, we don't really think about as a hero. Yeah, I, I, I like the, you know, these people, I'm speaking of, you know, epidemiologists, virologists, microbiologists, you know, many of them to spend their lives in the lab. And then there are those like my hero, Henry Parsons, who go out in the world and, and, and confront novel diseases, uh, oftentimes alone or very, you know, very few people around them, it, deadly things like Ebola and so on. I, things that, frankly, I wouldn't get caught <laughs> dead near. I mean, I'd rather go to a war zone. But, uh, you know, these are brilliant people, uh, but also, you know, they're humanitarians and they're incredibly courageous. And so I, I thought this, there's no problem to make a hero out of such person. And that was, you know, really, you, they do work in obscurity. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it, uh, it's only occasionally, like in a pandemic situation that we're in right now, that you see how valuable they are to our society. You know, you're, you know, known, most known for your investigative reporting and your, your nonfiction. And I'm curious how you decide, you know, when you want to pursue, like what, what it, you know, it, you have done a couple of, I mean, you, you've done a couple of novels or, and, and the screenplay for a film, which was also incredibly <laughs> prescient, kind of, some people said predicted 9-11. So I want to, like, how do you decide when you're going to pursue a novel or what, you know, what, what, what makes you want to take a project like that on? Yeah, it's really hard to answer that question, Lila, because I'm in the position right now of trying to find another project. And if I knew the answer to your question, I'd be able to do it probably a little easier. Every time it's different. And occasionally, you know, an editor will suggest something to me, like my editor at the New Yorker, David Remnick, suggested that he wanted me to explain Texas. And I just immediately lit up. I thought, you know, in my my book, uh, God Save Texas, came out of that conversation. I knew immediately it was great and perfect for me. And uh, I don't know why I didn't think of it. Yeah, you know, it, but then, uh, and Ridley uh, had suggested, you know, the, planted the seed of this novel in my mind. So sometimes, those very rare occasions, uh, somebody helps. Usually, you know, I'm in this state of, I'm wanting to get pregnant. <laughs> I just, I'm, I'm ready. I'm prepared. Uh, I am uh, I'm on the lookout. And mm -hmm. so I'm thinking about, you know, what's going on in the world and what conversation do I want to be a part of? You know, when I was a, a younger reporter, uh, I was interviewing a witch in, in uh, San Francisco, kind of a famous witch named Starhawk. And I was making a speech uh, next week in Austin, my first big public speech. And uh, I said uh, that I was nervous about it because when I make a speech or any, I really hadn't done it, but when I speak in public, my voice gets high and my knees would shake. And, and she <laughs> said, well, we witches have a saying where there's fear, there's power. Mm. And I thought about that uh, a lot because I, I, first of all, I thought, what does that mean? But I thought for what it meant for me was uh, the things that scare me are maybe the things that I should be looking at. And, you know, so I often try to take a look at things that uh, in like a pandemic, uh, you know, that uh, the things that, that are really kind of frightening in many respects, maybe there's something there for me. Mm. And uh, maybe I can find something that would allow myself to explore uh, the very things that are most frightening. Mm. I love that. Um, I love that idea. And there's something, I mean, and it seems like that's been really fruitful in your career because you have, you've focused on, you know, in your, in your fictional work, you have focused on these very frightening things that have ultimately, you know, come, come to pass. Yeah. Um, once you, once you set, once you do have, like, have identified that, you know, that object of fear, that area of interest, how do you, like, how do you begin to go about, you know, reporting on it? Or, you know, if, do you think about it as reporting, even if it's for a fictional project? Well, my, 
I, I guess I'm the kind of person that likes to know what really happens. I get more excitement out of uh, knowing how something goes down in, in real life than just guessing. Uh, you know, I, I don't mean to sound demeaning to the imaginative process, <laughs> but for me, my imagination is kindled by knowing what's real. And uh, so in this novel, I, I researched it the same way I would a New Yorker story or a nonfiction book. You know, I, it's a little different. Uh, you know, in, in journalism, you have an obligation to talk to as many people as you can. And, you know, that's, you know, that's sort of the basic rule of journalism is you cover the waterfront and you get a kind of consensus. But, and I call that the horizontal axis of journalism. But there's another which is that there are some people that are just more cogent, more amusing, more knowledgeable, more candid. And, uh, and those people you go back to again and again, and that's kind of the vertical axis. And in this particular case, I needed more of those kinds of people that would be able to not only talk to me about their lives and their, you know, their science, but actually coach me and read portion of my book. In fact, there were times when I wrote myself into a corner uh, and <laughs> I didn't know how to get out of it. I had to come up, had my, my hero had to come up with some brilliant solution that was totally beyond me. And I would turn to my experts and, you know, people that are right now developing those vaccines, you know, and I say, here's the situation and here are the limitations. And they were so happy uh, because essentially disease detectives are puzzle solvers hmm. and they I gave them a puzzle a riddle and and that's their minds immediately leapt into action and so it was it was terrific fun working with them yeah that's so I mean so these are some of the people like your sources are now like some of the foremost you know experts in the country trying to yeah. save us right I mean at the time did you get the feeling that they were partly interested in talking to you because no one was paying attention to the warnings that they were trying to give? I think that they all felt that uh, public health was in a crisis. And, you know, the cutbacks had been severe. And, uh, you know, the, the fact that, you know, for instance, the, the, the vaccine that we're looking at right now, the one that Moderna is trying to put in production, it actually started as a vaccine out of the National Institute of Health for MERS, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. But the disease died down and so the money dried up. We might be having a vaccine right now if, uh, if, you know, if there had been a, a sufficient amount of interest in public health to push it through. So everybody knew that uh, you know, this pandemic was on the horizon. They just didn't know when it would actually occur. What was the level of like anxiety that you would encounter about when you were researching about a pandemic of this scale? Well, you know, there are wonderful tabletop exercises that have been done uh, at Johns Hopkins in particular and elsewhere, where they would enlist people in government, senators and people in the health and human services and CDC and so on. They bring them all together and they say, here's the situation a new virus has suddenly erupted in, in China. You know, you find this in tabletops all the time. And, you know, uh, it's, it's been kind of kept under the rug, but we expect it will, you know, there are, you know, 5 million travelers from China every day into the United States. And so what happens next and what do we do? And how are, are we prepared? And, you know, the tabletop exercises were pretty clear that we weren't prepared. That you know that each in each of these scenarios, it unfolds into some kind of disaster because of this or because of that, and so the preparation was there. Everybody knew what needed to be done. Everybody knew that we would fail the test. That was the thing that was so shocking to me is that we weren't prepared. And in and year after year, uh, it was demonstrated in these tabletop exercises some of which are much more similar to the environment we're in right now than, than the novel that I wrote. Mm. And I mean, how do you, do you, what's your assessment of, you know, based on this, this reporting and also then, you know, the, the scenario you wrote in your book, like how do you think we are 
holding up to the standing up to this challenge? I mean, how are we how are we doing? <laughs> well, the United States has four percent of the world's population and thirty percent of the deaths. So somebody has to be held accountable for that. And it's not just one person or one administration. It's a society that has failed. Our society has failed us. And I think one thing that, you know, a, a pandemic like a depression or a war is like an x-ray. It, it shows you where all the broken places are. And I think we all see that now. Now, the question is, are we strong enough as a society to repair the, the civilization that we hope to be? Or are we gonna let the partisanship and the lack of accountability and, and, the, and maybe sometimes mistaken priorities uh, continue? Mm -hmm. uh, in, in which case uh, we will have failed because this isn't the last pandemic and it's probably not the worst one. You know, uh, the question that I asked the experts about 1918 still lingers in the air. We could look back at COVID-19 as a blessing and say, thank God we had this happen to us because we got together, we created the vaccines, we, we filled up our national storehouse with you know, personal protective equipment. We got everything together and here comes a, a far worse pandemic and we're ready for it. I hope that we'll be able to say that. Well, it's true. It's interesting, like how, you know, you see these countries, you know, in Asia and Africa that had to deal with, you know, Ebola, SARS, MERS do have procedures in place that, you know, when we have none. Um, right. African countries have done remarkably well. Uh, and, it, you know, I hope that that continues. But, you know, they they put in travel restrictions and, and masking and everything long before uh, we did. And so, you know, I think the experience and as SARS did in Asia, uh, you know, the habit of wearing a mask. Uh, quickly took off after SARS because with SARS, about 10% of the people infected actually died. And with MERS, it was 35%. And we still haven't established uh, what COVID is, but it may be around 1% to 3%. Uh, it's far less, you know, fatal than its cousins. But, uh, you know, it could be we'll be facing something like that. Mm. Um. You know, you've been called a prophet, and I was just curious. You know what? You know what you make of that when people say that or have said that about you? Well, it's <laughs> I don't know what to say. The the start with you know like the siege that movie that you referenced earlier on, uh, which was came out in 1998, and in that case, um, I had you know a simple question which was what would happen if terrorism came to our country, just as it had in you know, London and Paris and Tel Aviv, what, happened, what would happen if it came to New York? That was the, you know, so I went and talked to people in the FBI and the intelligence community. Uh, and, uh, and you know, once again, it was a very similar experience to the you know, research for this. They knew something was gonna happen. They knew we were due. I would hear that again and again. So. The anxiety that uh, that that movie reflects uh, is, uh, you know, based on the interviews that I had with people who were counter terrorists and just they could lay out a scenario for me. And uh, so, you know, the question, you know, that I took into this research is what would happen if the Spanish flu happened now? Uh, so that's where prophecy <laughs> comes from. It's just. <laughs> is asking a pertinent question mm -hmm. and uh and then timing has a lot to do with it uh you know i had no idea this novel would come out in the middle of this awful pandemic um uh, and you know i never intended to publish a book when the bookstores are closed and the airports are empty so <laughs> that was another consideration mm. um right that's true have you how have you found this publishing experience of, of you know not being able to tour not being not having bookstores open it's totally different experience you know I've, I've done a lot of virtual interviews like this one and um you know i'm glad that you know there there are ways of acquiring a book now without having to go to a bookstore but uh it makes it hard it's challenging uh and 
so, but I'm not complaining. I mean, I've gotten a lot of attention. I had <laughs> some British interviewer for BBC or Channel 4, and he started my interview off by, I suppose if there were no pandemic, no one would pay any attention to this novel at all. <laughs> so I thought, well, that could be true. <laughs> Thank you for your remarks. Interesting. I want to go back to something you said earlier about, you know, this question of like, if, you know, are we doing better than they were doing in 1918? Like, are we better prepared now than than you know they were a hundred years ago? Why stop at a hundred years? You know, the main the main tactic that we're using uh, to combat uh, the coronavirus is quarantine, which was invented by the Italians in the 14th century. Mm -hmm. uh, so. <laughs> In some respects, not much has changed. We're much more scientifically adept, and we know, you know, in the 14th century, they had no idea what was causing the plague. Uh, in you know, in, in 1918, they didn't know what a virus was. So we're far more sophisticated than than our ancestors were. But better prepared, better protected. Uh, at this point, it, it doesn't seem to be the case. It's so fascinating. It's like, what is scientific progress, you know, when you think about it in those terms, you know, when we're basically just, you know, in terms of saving lives where, you know, where we were hundreds of years ago. Well, it, I think scientific progress, let's separate it from medical progress. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, science has made extraordinary strides, you know, it does every generation, there's amazing changes because of science. I don't think that uh, humanity as a whole puts a high enough price on the cost of nature. Uh, you know, the, the, we, I guess, you know, the CIA, for instance, never con considered pandemics a pri priority item. Uh, although, uh, or even climate change, hurricanes and things like that. You know, all these things do a far more damage than terrorism. Mm -hmm. And uh, and yet, you know, we don't defend ourselves against natural occurrences, uh, and they are much more potent than what we do to ourselves. Right. It's hard to imagine. Yeah, like what what terrorist organization could do the kind of damage that this pandemic has already done or the plagues of history have done. Although Lila, it does worry me since I've, you know, spent a lot of time writing and understand, trying to understand terrorism. There are terrorist groups that are interested in bioweapons hmm. and, uh, you know, Al Qaeda was, uh, Om Shinrikyo, this, you, you remember the Japanese cult, uh, built around a, a blind yoga instructor. You could never tell where these things arise. Mm -hmm. And they murdered people on the Japanese subways with sarin gas, but they were interested in reducing the human population. Mm -hmm. And there are, uh, there are white supremacist groups with the same goal. And then of course there are, you know, nations that have created bio warfare. We, we did is extensively during the Cold War, and I don't think the Russians have ever actually surrendered all of their stockpiles of smallpox and Marburg and even the 1918 flu. Hmm. I mean, yeah, one of the most sort of disturbing threads in your book is about pursuing the possibility that it is, you know, that the virus was man-made. And of course, that's another, that's a conversation that's happening now right? as well. I mean, you know, and, and you, I, did you interview people who had been involved in the, I mean, there was, you know, the, in the U.S. I, had what I can say about that is I went to Fort Detrick, mm -hmm. uh, which is where it took place. And, uh, you know, there's a, there's a big building in the middle of the campus of Fort Detrick. It's an old farm, uh, you know, that been turned into this, you know, bioweapons uh, area. And now uh, Nixon, uh, and during the Nixon administration, uh, decided to withdraw uh, the American participation in the creation of bio biological or chemical weapons. But that doesn't mean it's stopped exactly, because you know there there's a a goal of protecting Americans against future viruses or even concocted ones. So to do that kind of protection, I'm supposing. Uh, there is still 
uh, inside this secret building at Fort Detrick where even people who work at other buildings in Fort Detrick have no idea what's going on. Mm -hmm. I'm supposing that inside that building, they are still cooking up different viruses to see what might happen if you did this or that. And, and I'm glad they are. I think that we should be prepared for novel viruses that might be man-made. Mm. Um, I'm gonna go to some questions from um, the audience now. Um, can you recall specifically, you know, when and how you realized that life was imitating your art? <laughs> With this particular novel, uh, <laughs> the, uh, yeah, I, you know, the the Chinese made their announcement about the novel virus on New Year's Eve. It had already been circulating in Wuhan for maybe as long as six weeks, and uh, so they kept it quiet during that time. And then on New Year's Eve, they, they felt compelled to say that there was a new virus. And immediately I thought of SARS. Uh, in 2003, there was this outbreak of, of, of SARS in China and they hid it. Uh, when the rumors uh, got out about a, a novel disease, very fatal one uh, in China, and world health authorities uh, went to try to investigate. The Chinese actually put patients in ambulances and had them ride around the city uh, until the authorities were gone. So they went to such extremes, extremes to hide the fact that they had a fatal disease. Uh, so that immediately awakened, because I'd just written a novel about something like that. Then, you know, there was all this reassurance from the, uh, the Trump administration that it wasn't going to come here. We've got this under control. And I thought a virus is, is a very difficult thing to control. Mm -hmm. uh, there's so many different ways in which it moves around. And in, the, in an age of almost instant uh, tra transportation, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just impossible. I just knew that it would come here. So mm -hmm. I guess that's when I, uh, when I thought about the fact that we would be facing something within a few months. Did you talk to your sources like during that time? Uh, yeah, yeah, I did. And what were they, what were they telling you? Oh, well, there was, you know, they're gearing up vaccines. You know, it was uh, first thing they were trying to do is get the vaccine, get the, the virus sequenced. And uh, the Chinese were able to do that. And once they got the sequence, then they went to work trying to try to create a, a vaccine. Mm -hmm. um, here's another question from the audience. Um, what about COVID-19 scares you more than in your novel? Well, the thing about COVID-19 is it's, it, it presents itself in so many different ways. And we're still trying to learn what it is. The, uh, you know, here are the things about it that I find, you know, first of all, the question was, is it a respiratory disease? Well, yes, but it also happens to affect the kidneys, the heart, the lungs, even seems to create dementia. Well, is it just affecting old people? Oh yeah, no, well, wait a minute. Uh, young people are getting it. Oh, young people are having strokes. Uh, it's uh, the it's it's are people able to get reinfected? No, that never happens with you know, viruses. Well, wait a minute. It seems to be happening. Uh, you know, it's just endless. How every week there seems to be some new manifestation of this virus that we don't understand. Uh, and I've heard, you know, that there's one report of uh, that I've heard. Uh, that uh, uh, some people might be capable of shedding the virus for 60 days. Well, and you know, of course, there's all this stuff about shedding virus when you're not, you don't have any symptoms. That's true of flu as well, but seems to be more true of, of COVID. So it's a mysterious, highly contagious disease. And we're just lucky at this point, it's not more fatal, but it you know, in 1918, the flu mutated and became more fatal. So I hope that that doesn't happen with COVID. Mm. Um, as part of your research, did you speak with some of the same CDC and HHS officials that we're hearing from now and that the public is becoming familiar with? No, I didn't want to talk to administrators. Uh, I wanted to talk to people that were in the labs or actually on the ground epidemiologists. So, uh, you know, 
Bar Barney Graham, for instance, is at the National Institute of in Allergies and Infectious Diseases, which is in NIH. And he's the one who oversaw the, the, the vaccine that is currently in human trials that, uh, that showed such, pr such promise the other day. Uh, thanks to Barney Graham, that we have that. But that's, those are the kind of people that I wanted to talk to, the people that actually uh, are, you know, not just the counselors, but, you know, uh, the brilliant minds that are at the core of our public health uh, establishment. Mm. I wanted to ask you more about the, your, how you approach, the, like how you use these sources when you were drafting. Like, you know, when you get in, I mean, maybe a specific example of, you know, you're, you're stuck in a corner or you don't know how something's going to play out and then you go to them and how did those conversations play out and how did that ultimately influence, you know, drafting the book? Lila, there's a great example, but it's a, such a spoiler for the book that I'm, I'm, I'm afraid <laughs> I don't want to answer it. I, if, if everybody had read the book, I would love to tell the story of how uh, I, I got my hero to solve uh, the, one of the most difficult problems that medicine has ever faced. But, you know, and, I, and I'm asking the people, I'm asking Barney, and I'm asking the, you know, the guy you interviewed at Pfizer, uh, uh, Philip Dormitzer, uh, you know, these are the people that are making the vaccines right now, the ones that are most promising. And I caught them at a, at a point when they had a little more time on their hands. Mm. How do you assess um, Austin and Texas's response to the virus outbreak? Well, we're very lucky. Uh, and Austin did one thing that was uh, extremely wise, but very costly, which was to decide South by should not happen in, at least in reality, if not virtually. And um, it, was, it came at a terrible cost to the city. But had we had South by, I'm convinced that we would have become an epicenter like New Orleans was after you know Mardi Gras and St. Patrick's Day. Um, so we saved ourselves a lot of grief. Um, and the other thing is that we sent all our college kids home. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, those two things saved Austin from having a far worse experience. And now Texas, you know, we got 50,000 cases. Uh, and uh, you know, that's, you know, that's more than, you know, if we just compare it to flu, a really bad season in the entire United States would be 50,000 cases. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's just take it at that level. And, you know, we, we, we have, uh, you know, not, we've not been touched the way that a lot of states have. Uh, and now the governor has taken a very aggressive stance towards uh, opening the state up because of, you know, the, well, you know, the, obviously the economic damages are, something that we have to take very seriously. And I support a good part of that, but I, I worry about opening up bars and hair salons and stuff like that. And, you know, he said, at, you know, he has taken the, the counsel of a lot of medical experts, uh, but, you know, he said that we would pull back if, uh, if the infections uh, began to increase and they increased immediately, uh, mm -hmm. you know, within, you know, with the same day that he made the announcement. Uh, so it's a, it's a risky course. Uh, I, would, I would have counseled being a little more cautious. Uh, yeah, do you believe that there, that there are, are there really epidemiologists who are saying right now, go to the bar, you know, go inside, mix together in big groups? Yeah, there's, this is America and people will say anything. <laughs> you know, so you, I'm sure that, uh, I'm sure Fox News has found somebody that would say that, but uh, the consensus uh, opinion, I think, of most medical experts is that we have to remain cautious, continue to socially distance, uh, vulnerable populations such as the one that I happen to inhabit uh, should uh, be much more cautious about going out. But uh, as, you know, the cases decline, uh, we might be able to feel a little more adventurous. And, uh, you know, and I'm looking forward to that day myself. Mm, yeah.
Yeah, I know. It's like, it. I mean, it's hard being, um, it wears on you. You know, I think everyone I've talked to, it feels that I feel it too. You know, you want to go back out into the Well, there's a, the, there's a low level depression, at least low. And, you know, there's a starting point all over the world. Everybody feels suppressed and depressed. And, uh, you know, it's, it's going to leave scars. You know, there'll be emotional scars. Uh, and, uh, and, and God knows the financial cost is something that we haven't even begun to weigh. We don't know what the world is going to be like when the curtain opens again and we can walk out in the world. Mm. How, do you, how, do you, how have you been managing, you know, your, your quarantine? Well, uh, in many respects, my life has probably less changed than most. I mean, I'm a writer and I work at home. <laughs> but I can't go out and report. That's uh, that makes it really difficult. I can't travel, uh, so in in that respect, it's been hard. Uh, I'm in a band, and we can't play together. We see my daughter and her husband. Uh, they're the only people we see, and we're the only people they see. So you know, we have dinner a couple of times a week, and and fortunately, they're both musicians, so we can sit around and play some music. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I have a breakfast group that meets uh, every Monday has been so for nearly 30 years. So now we zoom our breakfast. And so we keep up with each other. Um, and, you know, but there is this Groundhog Day quality to life, you know, that, uh, you know, the, without the expectation that that I'll be going out. Without the expectation that I might be getting on a plane and going off onto some new story, uh, you know, life falls down into its ordinariness. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's pretty much how I've been living my quarantine. In the various interviews that you've done so far, what is the one question you haven't been asked, but you wish someone would ask you? Well, you know, I talked a little bit of, I brought up the question of biological warfare. Uh, and, you know, that no one had asked me that, so I decided I would put a, push it forward myself. <laughs> it's, it, I know it sounds crazy to people, you know, but, you know, biology, you know, disease by definition is uncontrollable. But there are anarchic elements in the world that are willing to do that. And years ago, I did a profile of the director of national intelligence, and I got to go... Uh, talk to a lot of people in the intelligence community, including the guy that makes all the stuff that you see in James Bond, <laughs> our equivalent. And he didn't get to show me the stuff, but uh, I asked him what, uh, what worried him. And uh, he said, well, what really concerned him is that these high school kids that are doing, making computer viruses now will soon be able to make actual biological viruses given the technological advances. And you know, like CRISPR is, you know, uh, become a mainstream uh, gene editing tool. Uh, and uh, yes, yeah, terrifying to think that, uh, you know, we have so much power now because of our technology uh, and how that will enhance, uh, you know, the terrorists of the future and the present and, and also the kind of warfare that we might engage in. Do you think that's a possible, I mean, do you feel like that's a possibility for COVID-19? I don't because, you know, when you genetically create something, it leaves a, a track. Uh, you know, you can look at the, you know, through electron microscopes at the DNA strands and see if it's been edited. And um, so, you know, there are, uh, and it also it matches almost perfectly, a, a, you know, a COVID strain found in bats. So I, I don't think that there's much likelihood that anybody's tinkered with it. Now, diseases do escape from labs. Uh, you know, they had diseases escape from the CDC. Uh, you know, it, it, it happens. Uh, it's not perfect. But uh, so it could have been in that lab in Wuhan. Uh, I mean, I'm sure the virus itself was in the lab because they study bat diseases and thank God they do. Uh, you know, they were trained uh, by Texans. So I'm, I'm sure that 
they do a good job. <laughs> um, did you consider the politicization of the pandemic and how polarized, you know, we are and the sort of the force, the, the pressure that would, you know, create and this, this, you know, question between health and economic well-being. Yeah, I did. I mean, I wanted to look at our society and uh, I'm not trying to implicate any one person or administration, but I wanted to look at our society and how divided it is and the antagonisms and needless partisanships, you know, that all of this, I, I wanted to take all of that and take it into account. How would we respond given, given who we are? And, um, you know, do you think that that has something to do with, I mean, do you think there's a relationship between that, the, the politicization and, you know, the way that we ignore, the way we decided not to prepare for a future pandemic? I mean, is that, or are those just two, like, unfortunate aspects of our society right now? I think that's true. I mean, you know, I, I think we've become far more partisan, uh, but just in the terms of public health, for instance, uh, it was the Bush administration, the George W. Bush administration, that began to take pandemics really seriously. And uh, the, you know, the national stockpile was uh, created and enlarged. Uh, and uh, then the Obama, Obama administration paid attention to pandemics. Uh, without doing very much about it. They didn't cut the budgets of CDC and so on, but, you know, it was not a priority for them. Um, and then, you know, along comes the Trump administration, and the Obama administration had done a good job of creating a briefing book, doing tabletop exercises and so on. Uh, and, uh, you know, the Trump administration... Uh, even did their own exercise. You know, I mean, they, they, it's it's hard to account for the the inaction of, of the administration, except for the fact that they cut the budgets of the Center for Disease Control and Health Services. They they eliminated the global health response team that was a part of the National Security Council that would be leading the the American response to COVID. So essentially, it was an assault on science, not a support of it. Mm. And I mean, do you think like is that so? Like, is that why we ignored the warnings from epidemiologists? This like that was basically the assault on science. We just made the decision not only to ignore them, but to sort of like actively, you know, debilitate them. Well, it reminds me of you know our response to nine eleven, and you know the the, the, the before nine eleven that the government ignored the warning of counter-terrorists that, you know, the, this nation was in danger. It just seemed impossible. How could you even think? It was, they were essentially laughed out of the room. And uh, so, you know, it's something similar to that, I think, is that there's an aura of disbelief. And mm -hmm. disbelief is founded on partisan belief. You know, and the partisan belief is founded on how the world really works. And, you know, I think that that's, you know, basically there are different worldviews uh, and all of these reactions stem from that. Mm. Are, how, are you personally preparing for a possible recurrence in the fall? Well, to the extent that one prepares, uh, I mean, I, you know, for this particular wave, I ordered masks and gloves pretty early on and, you know, stocked up on groceries, planted some seeds. Um, but you know, I, I'm, I'm wondering how to handle what might happen in the fall. And uh, I'm praying for a vaccine, if not a vaccine, at least I hope my, I'm putting my money on uh, plasma therapy. Mm. Uh, but unfortunately, that's hard to scale up. Uh, you have to bleed the people who have, uh, you know, recovered the convalescence. And then, you know, each week you can bleed them if they're willing to. And uh, you maybe get from each uh, session enough plasma to treat two or three uh, people. But that you to scale that up to mi hundreds of millions of people, that's that's uh, not so easy. So I I think that you know people are going to be really tired of being sequestered, 
Uh, and so if we have another wave in the fall, and let, if it's really dramatic, I think people will be frightened enough to stay indoors and will have been trained to know how to do it. Mm. But uh, absent a, a vaccine, pretty much everybody's going to get it. Um, how long did you spend researching this book and how, how does that compare to sort of your, your typical amount of time if you have one for, you know, researching and investigating and writing your books? I don't really have a typical amount of time, you know, because every, every book is its own experience and is, you know, creates its own challenges. Um, but I, I spent about a year and a half uh, researching and writing, I guess. Uh, yeah, up to the point of turning it in. And then of course there's rewrites. But I, when I start researching, I try to get to a point where I feel confident en enough to write. My biggest mistake as a writer oftentimes is starting too soon. Mm -hmm. And then I get to the point where I, I realize I don't know enough. And uh, then I have to go back and just do more research. Um. I experienced that too. I feel like one of my editors would used to say, you know, there's no, like whatever, any problem in writing is really a problem in reporting. I, it's, it, maybe not any problem, but it, it does solve a lot of problems. <laughs> um, I'm curious, you know, how you think about um, the, the way that like the political clashes we're seeing right now um, and the way that leadership, you know, is manipulating the bias of the weak and, and, and ignorance um, of the privilege reflected in the book that you wrote and sort of the relationship you see between the two. Well, I, I do talk about in the book about how uh, the, the, the upper classes, the, the wealthy few, uh, are able to escape things and, and they're, you know, and you begin to see things, you know, like the four seasons opening up and stuff, you know, upper end, upper tier things that, that uh, you know, only the really wealthy people can take advantage of. Um, but, you know, to be honest, it's worse in real life than it is in the novel. <laughs> you know, the, the ways in which, uh, you know, uh, I, you, you like to you like to think well you you might think that uh, that disease is democratic and it's not uh, you know the, the more money you have the less likely you are to be infected and uh, and if infected the more likely you are to get good treatment mm. right and that's like always been it seems like it's always been true or for hundreds of years has been true about plagues. Like the rich can sort of flee the cities and. Yeah. There. No, I'm, I'm reading Boccaccio's Decameron, uh -huh. about, which was uh, set and, you know, he wrote it right after the plague uh, in Florence in, uh, in the 14th century. And it's about a, a group of 10 friends sheltering in place. And they, they're really rich people. You get it you know, immediately. You get the sense that you know they come from privilege, and uh, you know they they uh, the the novel is you know it, it's a series of tales like the Canterbury Tales or Scheherazade, mm -hmm. but uh, you know it's always a case of it seems that you know the rich and the privileged uh, are the people that uh, are restored to their power. They are you know there's some incident happens where they might be humbled, but then they get their revenge. Uh, you can really see the feudalism of the Middle Ages reflected <laughs> in, in that novel. Um, as a reporter, you know, what, what news sources do you think are doing the best job of covering the pandemic? That's a good question. I, I think that um, there are a lot of, you know, a, a lot of outlets that are doing excellent work especially given the constraints that we reporters are facing right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, the mainstream, in the mainstream press, I think in particular, uh, the Post and the Times are, you know, living up to their uh, responsibilities. Um, but there are a lot of, you know, nude media, you know, blogs, uh, you know, things that, you know, that I, I've been talking to people on, uh, and it, there's another thing that's happening. I'm just now realizing, you know, there are all these uh, group chats that have sp 
popped up, you know, using, you know, quite expert people. Uh, you know, I've been on a lot of COVID calls, you know, that, you know, they would bring in, you know, governors or, you know, Nobel Prize winning scientists and so on. And, and, uh, and some of them last for an hour and some for a couple of hours. Uh, and I find that I get a tremendous amount of news from, uh, you know, being on those calls uh, mm -hmm. from uh, experts that I'm, I might not, experts I might have heard of and some that I've never heard of. That they've been, that's a, I think, a totally new news outlet that has been created by uh, COVID. Hmm. Um, you know, I mean, the ending of, of your book is so dark. I mean, there is a vex. I mean, I, I don't want to give anything away, but you're getting very close to the edge here. I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to stay on this side of the edge. Right. I will say it's like the world is transformed and not for the better, right. By, by the disease, you know, that wrecks your, your pandemic. And I, and I mean, do you think that that's what we're, I mean, do you think, do you think that there is a possibility that this pandemic could lead to a better society? This is my greatest hope, Lila. Uh, I, I've been working on a story for the New Yorker about uh, the Black Death, and uh, the uh, and what happened after the Black Death uh, was the Renaissance. Hmm. Uh, you know, I don't think the the Black I don't think the Renaissance would have happened, and I don't think it would have happened in Italy had it not been for you know the fact that half the population of Europe uh, was killed by that disease, hmm. and. Uh, and it, it came in waves, you know, it lasted for 300 years, really. <laughs> um, but uh, it, uh, it offered society an opportunity to reset. You know, it was a society that was feudalistic. Uh, it was um, pietistic, you know, run by very corrupt uh, clergy um, and uh, in, in constant warfare. And uh, what happened is that, you know, labor became scarce. And so uh, craftsmen began to unionize and, and, and get more wages. Middle class was created. Artisans uh, began to define the culture. And it, it, it became the foundations of the modern world were established. Well, we could do that. It's in our hands. We know what's wrong with us. It's real clear. Uh, but will we? Uh, you know, this is, you know, in a novel, I, I don't offer much hope. I, but as I said, it's a cautionary tale that we could go in this direction, but we could go in another direction as well. We could address the, you know, the partisanship. We could create a more just and compassionate society. Uh, we could honor science. And, and uh, there are so many things that we could do that would make our civilization stronger. Now, the, Right now, I think what we see so starkly is its weakness. Mm. Was that part of your goal for writing the book, um, having it be a cautionary tale? Yeah, kind of. I mean, but it was, it's my mood. You know, this is, you know, the way I feel about things. Hmm. And, uh, you know, researching it made me realize the inherent problems that, you know, the rifts and the defaults that, you know, are inside our, our society. And I, I got a better look at, the kind of civilization that we live in now. But I, I, I think of civilization as being like a, a frozen lake, you know, and uh, you think it's safe to walk on uh, mm -hmm. because you've always walked on it. And, and, but with ice, you don't know how thin it can become. And I think our civilization is very thin right now. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think that the novel reflects my own bleak anxiety about where we are. Mm. Well, I I agree. <laughs> on that note, <laughs> yeah. it was so nice to, to talk to you again. It's been a pleasure talking to you again, Lila, and thanks for doing this. Yes, it was my pleasure.